Scripture lesson for today comes from Acts chapter 2, beginning in verse 42, Acts 2, 42 to 47. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. Awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. This is the word of God for God's people today. Thanks be to God. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves. We started a new series last Sunday we're calling Devoted. We are looking at the beginning of what we now know as the church. Just weeks after the death and resurrection of Jesus, this group was assembled in Jerusalem. And after the day of Pentecost, Luke tells us there were about 3,000 of them. They welcomed Peter's message. They were baptized. And then, he says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayers. Now, Luke is neither a historian nor a journalist in the modern sense of those words, but but the book of Acts is our most comprehensive telling of the movement that gave birth to the Christian church. Beginning with the resurrection of Jesus, Acts chronicles the deliberations and the actions of the church at Jerusalem, the spread of Christianity across Greece and Asia Minor, uh, and Paul's apostolic trip even to Rome to take Christianity to the empire. This is the story of the work of God that changed the world, that, that changed human history. It's worthy of our attention. Last week we looked at they devoted themselves to the apostles' teachings I reminded you last week that at that point, they didn't have a New Testament. Uh, They didn't have a scripture to turn to. Uh, The stories of Jesus were circulating in the oral tradition. In many ways, the apostles themselves were the text. And so uh, we now have those stories, those teachings, those experiences of the life and the the lessons and the ethics of Jesus in, in our scripture Last week, uh, we turned our attention towards the idea of reading the Bible. To be, what does it mean to be devoted to the stories, devoted to the scriptures, to the teachings of the apostles? And so the challenge was to read scripture every week, every day of the week. And we took our cue from a youth challenge uh, and from the response of our teenagers to read a chapter of the Gospel of John every day for 21 days so that we would be engaged in a devotion to the scripture. And, and, and I heard from some of you this week, I heard conversations. Somebody said to me, you know, I want to read the Bible every day, but I don't. Uh, and plain and simple, she said, I lack the devotion that I need. And this was a challenge that helped. So every day this week, she read a chapter of the Gospel of John, and she was not alone. I, I heard conversations in the line on Wednesday night supper about Nicodemus, which was chapter 3 that we had gotten to this morning in the coffee shop. I heard somebody talking about the feeding of the 5,000, which was yesterday's chapter. So people are engaged in that reading devoted to the apostles' teachings. You'll remember last week that we talked about how it was hard to define devotion. The dictionary says it's very loyal or very loving, but when do you cross the threshold from interested in to very devoted, to very loving or very loyal? That It's hard to define it, but you know it when you see it. You know devotion when you encounter it and We know it when we see it, even if we have a hard time describing it. Some of you know Bethany Hamilton's story. She grew up in Hawaii, 
So by age seven, she was an accomplished surfer. She was sort of nowhere on the radar until in 20, uh, 2003, a shark bit off her left arm while she was surfing. As she was recovering, she made two promises to herself that she would never whine about her condition and that she would surf again. Now, a lot of people would have spent a lot of time whining uh, and complaining about why did this happen to me? And a lot of people, most people, I think, would have given up. But 26 days later, she was back on a surfboard. Now, I might not be able to define devotion, but you look at that story and you see it. She worked her way uh, into the top female surfers in the world and overcame many obstacles her story is told in film uh, in Soul Surfer. Uh, it is the story of devotion. They devoted themselves to the prayers. Like fellowship and the breaking of bread, the word prayers has that definite article with it. The prayers in the Greek. So it's, it's not just prayer, it's the prayers. We don't know exactly what the, the reference is to those prayers. The text is silent about the content. What we do know is that they spent time together in the temple and in homes praying. So these were not just private devotions. They included corporate prayer. No doubt it included the Jewish daily prayers and the Psalms and other prayers. At the hospital, when I visit, there's a receptionist over across the river at Coliseum. Vera gives us the room numbers and gives us a little badge to let us know where to go when we go to visit somebody in the hospital. Well, we're, we, I see her pretty much every week. And so when I walk in the door and start walking towards the table, she gets the clergy badge out because she knows that I'm coming to visit somebody. And we exchange pleasantries. I ask for a room number. She gives it to me. She gives me my badge and I go on. It's just that kind of informational transaction. When I walk into the bank, the teller whose line I usually get in, she knows my name even before uh, she gets my deposit slip. She's friendly. We exchange pleasantries. I give her the deposit. She gives me my money or my receipt, and, and, and it's an exchange back and forth. It's a transaction. We go to our favorite restaurant. They know us by name. They know what appetizer we always order. So they put the order in on our way to the table. We are very much creatures of habit. But it's a transaction. It's a, we have a good relationship. But I would not call any of those relationships deep or meaningful, significant or intimate. They, they are just transactional relationships. Certainly not the kind of relationship the psalmist describes when he says, My soul longs for you like a land, a dry desert land longs for water. My relationship with those folks is, is not deep. It's not sustaining. It's purely a transactional relationship. For a lot of people, that's prayer. Their prayer life is limited just to the list, the things we want or the things we need for others. It's purely a transactional relationship, not unlike those others that I mentioned. And in my opinion, if that's the limit of our prayer life, then, then we really are missing the greater part. It's been said that the most underutilized power in the world is, is not solar, it's not wind, it's not nuclear. It's the power of prayer channeled through the people of God into the world. If you talk to people, if you survey people, 71% of Americans say prayer is powerful. Another 15% say prayer probably helps, it doesn't hurt. So you figure 86% of the people around us think prayer is a good thing. But, but when asked, less than half, 48% pray regularly. Only 65% say they get around to praying once a month or more. Many regard prayer as sort of a spiritual airbag, only to be deployed in emergencies. 
It's like the two guys that were fishing. They were in the middle of the lake when the storm blew in and it popped up on them quick. The waves were breaking over the edge of their little John boat. It looked like they might swamp and they decided it was time for desperate measures. And the one guy yells out into the gales of the wind, "Uh, Lord, I haven't bothered you in 15 years. And if you get me out of this, I won't bother you again for 15 more. To only pray in emergencies. To use prayer like an airbag only in the middle of the crash. I would argue is to miss the real gift. The real invitation of prayer. Think about it. Do do we like those human relationships that are that way? Do we want to be connected to those people that every time you hear their voice on the phone, you know there's an ask coming Give me, give me, give me. We don't like those relationships with people. Why would we assume that God wants just that kind of relationship with us? At least I think the invitation is for something deeper. That God desires something more. Think think about the way we grow as we date on the way to marriage or in relationship. That that same growth and connection can happen with God. It can happen. It can happen if we share, if we move beyond just that transactional stage. Think about two people on a blind date. If, he, if all he ever does is talk about what he wants and what he needs, there's little likelihood there'll be a date number two, right? Not that saying that we have to always talk even. We can get to that place in relationship where just to be together and be aware of each other's presence is satisfying, right? The same is true of prayer and our relationship with God. David Stendhal Rost wrote, silence means the absence of sound, but, but silence is also the matrix from which word is born, and it is the home to which word returns through understanding. Our silent heart knows the paradox. The emptiness of silence is inexhaustibly rich. All the words in the world are merely a trickle of the fullness of silence. But to get to that place takes practice. It takes devotion. We at Vineville want to be known as a praying congregation. It's part of our vision to be known as a community of prayer. And Gina and the prayer team are leading us towards that. We, we have opportunities for corporate prayer on Tuesday mornings and Wednesday night and Thursday mornings. And, and we have made the prayer request a part of announcements of every worship service, encouraging people to get connected to that intercessory prayer ministry. And there are about 50 intercessory that receive those uh, prayer requests every week. The prayer ministry is strong. But we long for the day when when everybody participates. When 100% of the congregation makes daily prayer a part of their daily routine. And until we get to that place, then we keep at it. We want to be known as those devoted to prayer The most common frustration I hear people will say, Preacher, I sit down and about 15 seconds after I start, the to-do list pops into my head. uh, And then I'm off on a tangent. uh, And before long, you can describe my prayer life as wandering and worrying. Somebody said, whenever you talk about prayer, um, it, it adds stress to my life. Because I know I ought to do it, but the idea of doing one more thing uh, is just more than I can do. But if we, if we think about approaching prayer as spending time with someone who loves us, who wants good things for us, as sharing life with someone, then it can be something that brings confidence to us in the midst of the busyness. Learning to pray doesn't doesn't really offer us a less busy life, but it can offer us a less busy heart. In the midst of all the stuff, we can develop an inner quiet, an inner calm where life is more coherent, where we feel calmer and more ordered, even in the middle of the confusion 
and the to-do list. The problem is, is that despite our good intentions, we often get off course. You remember reading um, Homer, uh, the Odyssey and Iliad and uh, school and the story. Remember the sirens song, those half birds, half women whose music was so beautiful that it would lure the sailors off course. And then they end up wrecking their ship on the rocks. Remember how they get by them? Uh, they put wax in the ears of the sailors so they'll keep rowing. And, and he has himself tied to the mast of the ship so that he can listen to the music but not change the course of the boat. Well, I sort of think that something that dramatic is what we need because there are certainly siren songs that would pull us off course that say, take on one more thing, go one more place, put it off just one more day. We need those dramatic acts to hold the course. We need drastic and definitive action I want to make a couple of really just real practical suggestions. Some people sort of say, I don't know where to start. So I get real, real plain. Uh, the, the first simple is this is go to bed. <laughs> you know what? Um, uh, the best thing I can do tonight to be ready for tomorrow is get some sleep. Um, I don't know about you, but morning Jimmy is pretty good. Uh, creative, energetic, can stay focused. Night Jimmy is worthless. Um, and the best thing morning, the evening Jimmy can do for morning Jimmy is set him up for success by going to bed. And so getting some rest may be the place to start. And then when we get up, get awake, whether that's a shower or coffee or movement. And then get up and, and get to a quiet, quiet place. Get away. Jesus said, go into a closet and close the door. Well, maybe your closet's outside walk-in or somebody after 845 said her run was where she could get away. She didn't have a phone. Nobody could catch her. Um, she She was all by herself with God. But go to the place where you are not interrupted and then get going to do it. Take, you know, five minutes today is better than 30 minutes tomorrow. Because the likelihood of that 30 minutes tomorrow happening is pretty slim. And it's better to get going and then to keep going. Consistency in prayer is much more important than quantity. It's better to pray 10 minutes every day than to pray an hour today and not come back to it for three months. Which is often what we get real excited about it. We spend a long time and then the next time we do it, it's it's weeks away. It's a lifelong journey, and it builds, and so uh, we take small steps. Some people have asked me about a, a method. What's something I can remember? And so maybe, maybe if you're starting a new habit, if you want to start a new devotion, to think about the talk method, that we're going to be talking to God, but to think about talk as an acronym. The T is for thanksgiving. To start off praising God with a spirit of joy and gratitude for what God has done for us. And be specific. Name at least three things that you are grateful for. To talk to God about thanksgiving. The A is for ask. The petitioning. Telling God what you need and and what you need for others. What you hope in the world. What's coming in your day to ask. The L stands for listen. To to be still, to be quiet, to listen for God's word. And, and, And that can be the most difficult part. But if we will persevere, it can become the most powerful part of prayer. And the K is for keep a record. Write down the things you're thankful for. Write down the things that you prayed for. Write down the things you were feeling or thinking or the impressions that the Spirit leaves with you. One last suggestion as a way of, i tell you a story as a way of making one last suggestion. Um, Christina uh, was going to a spiritual director to try to get her prayer life in order. And uh, she walked in 10 minutes late for her appointment. She plopped down in the chair and said, there's just not enough time anymore. Uh, many of you, maybe most of us, can identify with that feeling. She, she shared how she wanted to pray. She set her clock 15 minutes early to get up, but she always hit the snooze button. 
Her baby was colicky. Her husband had trouble at work. She had a big project at her own work. She always felt guilty about not praying, but she never got around to it. She was planning to pray when this is over, when the bills are paid, when mom gets over her broken hip, when this is done, when she spent time planning to pray, but, but not actually praying but Christina took a definitive act, and, and I thought I'd share just her, her solution to her trouble. She christened her station wagon uh, a rolling sanctuary. And she, she decided to not talk on the cell phone anymore in the car. She Only in emergencies, would she, which also abides by our new state law, right? So she, she quit talking on the cell phone in the car. She turned off the radio and to avoid all extraneous noise. And, and then her car became a holy enclosure, a, a sort of rolling sanctuary, and her prayer life began to, to flourish. She, she had a definitive method, and I share it with you because you might use some of it. You might adopt it to your circumstance. When she got to a stop sign, she prayed for people who were ill. People who were sick and, and had special needs. She came to a red light. She played for upcoming activities in her day. If she went through a green light, she prayed for the flow of love and God's peace to, to go from her into others throughout her day. Whenever she got to a train crossing, as the train cars went by, as each car went by, she named a blessing and gave thanks to God for the way that that had blessed her life. When she would notice someone on the side of the road, a broke down car or somebody walking, she would offer up a prayer uh, of encouragement or deliverance. If, if a pond caught her eye, she might pray, giving thanks for the water of her baptism. If a field of flowers caught her eye, she would pray for the wonders of creation. Mile markers, Atlanta, 75, made her think about people she knew in Atlanta and offer up prayers on their behalf as she drove down the road. Christina's story prompts us to think about the way God might lead us to grow our prayer life, to mature our prayer life from what it's been to what it could be. Luke tells us that Jesus grew in wisdom and stature, uh, that he grew in favor with God and people. And I think we're called to grow as well, not to stay the same, but to grow and mature. So what might it look like for your prayer life to grow from where it is? You know, as part of our service today, we will, in just a few minutes, baptize Elizabeth Allen. And, and you will say, in the course of that service, we will pray for you. And as we receive new members, they will promise to support the church with their prayers and their presence, their gifts, their service, and their witness. And we as a congregation will reaffirm that same vow, that we will support the church with our prayers and presence. So it is a perfect occasion for us to renew that commitment, a chance to start over, to start fresh, that we might be known as those who were devoted to prayer. May God bless our efforts. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.